everybody. Hello. As you're just getting logged in to our special event today, welcome. Uh, we are hosting our special 30 year anniversary event through the California Institute for Human Science. So welcome. My name is Nicole Ryle, and I'm the Director of Development and Public Programs here at CIHS. CIHS Enlighten is the new Public to Pro Programs Division at CIHS, and we're offering certificate programs, continuing education, and community offerings like the one this afternoon. And today we are delighted to continue our 30-year anniversary series. <clears throat> Through this year, we have been celebrating our 30 years by hosting distinguished and inspiring guests who are doing notable work and research in the mind, body, spirit field, like Dr. Mills and Dr. Jane, who are with us today. These events are made possible by your donations, and we thank you for your support. You can donate with our super convenient text code listed right behind me, or I'll provide a direct link in the chat box if you'd like to donate online. And then at the end of our program, please stay tuned for uh, upcoming events and how you can stay involved with our vibrant and growing community. We also have a very short, less than one minute survey at the end of today's webinar. And if you could fill that out, that just helps us to know what you're looking for. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our CIHS president, Dr. Thomas Brophy. Thank you so much, Nicole. So, Welcome to this very special California Institute for Human Science 30th anniversary special live event. I'm Thomas Brophy, president of California Institute for Human Science, and I'm just extremely delighted to be able to introduce today's two featured presenters. Both of our presenters today have currently released books that are very much connected with CIHS's mission and the philosophy of CIHS's founder, Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama. I'm currently engrossed in reading both of these uh, fantastic books. Dr. Paul Mills' book, Science, Being, and Becoming the Spiritual Lives of Scientists, includes interviews and personal psycho-spiritual adventures of scientists themselves. There it is. In, and included amongst the uh, featured uh, 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 scientists in this book are several CIHS associated faculty. So it's really wonderful read. Uh, I'm in there briefly. Um, Paul is professor of public health and family medicine, director of the Center of Excellence for Research and Training in Integrative Health and former chief of behavioral medicine at the University of California, San Diego. His work has been featured in numerous mainstream uh, big time publications like Time Magazine, the New York Times, National Public Radio, and very fortunate for us at CIHS, Paul is also a trustee of CIHS. And Dr. Shamini James, Jane's book, Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science and the Future of Health. I get this on camera. brilliantly articulates the paradigmatic change that is happening right now in science and the biofield. And she does so in a very accessible, clear, and engaging way. It's a really uh, fantastic, I think, important book. Shamini is the founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, CHI, which is a friend of CHS organization. She also serves as adjunct faculty at UC San Diego. Her, her award-winning integrative science and spirituality research is also has been featured in major news outlets such as Time Magazine, CNN, and so forth. So now let's go to the real presenters today. And I'm looking forward very much to this. Thank you so much, Thomas. It's uh, such a pleasure and honor to be here. I have to just share a really brief story about CIHS, which is that I think I came to know about it um, in my 20s. And I have to think back a little bit to like what era that was. <laughs> but <laughs> It was quite a while ago. And CIHS, of course, was formed at that time. But I remember looking to it as I do now as one of the foremost leading schools in biofield research. And I remember speaking with graduate students at that time when I decided to come to UC San Diego 
um, to work with a dear mentor of mine who you might have heard of. His name is Dr. Paul Mills. <laughs> But while I was a graduate student um, at UCSD under Paul, I had the good fortune of also getting to know some of the graduate students at that time at CIHS. And it was a real joy to be able to have that school nearby and have the biofield discussions with the students who were deeply immersed in the study. So for me, it's kind of a full circle moment to be here with you today. And I just wanted to thank you and CIHS for all the wonderful work you continue to do in the biofield space. I'd like to add to that, uh, Shamini and Thomas and Nicole. Yes, I was at, I'm at UC San Diego, been there a long time, and it's a fairly reductionistic academic setting, as you know. And for me, when I discovered CIHS was maybe 15 or so years ago, it was a place for me to go to have a sense, okay, this is really what reality is about, the inclusiveness of not only science, but spirituality. And that really started to help fuel me fill my reserves a bit so I could go back into the den of materialism, so to speak, and kind of survive in progress. And then when I met Shamani, then that was an opportunity for me to then begin to integrate it better. For Shamani and I did some very um, innovative uh, energy work research at UC San Diego that we then published in some high tier journals. So it's been a great resource for me personally, CHS, as Shamani expressed, it has been for her too. Indeed, indeed. And, and Paul, maybe you know, you had suggested that um, maybe we begin the dialogue. I, you know, as you know, I have always I'm full of questions. You know that since I, you know, since I've been a student with you. And perhaps one of my first questions after I devoured this book literally in three days, of course, knowing what it was going to be on, but what a pleasure to read this book. You know, it really was such a, a beautiful read. And an and a easy read because it was very engrossing and I got to learn about so many of the stories of our colleagues, many who are known to CIHS, part of CIHS and also part of our Consciousness and Healing Initiative Scientific Advisory Council, many biofield scientists. Paul, you've had a span of a, a really amazing career in you know, what would now may be considered to be a mainstream area, psychoneuroimmunology, which as you know, was quite a frontier area when it began. Mm -hmm. You've done research in meditation. You've looked at the very deep scientific cellular underpinnings of mind, body, spirit practices, of exercise, you know, of lots of different integrative health approaches. And as you mentioned, the biofield work, you could have written for your first book, any number of books, you know, honestly, you could have, you could, there were many, many different directions that you could have decided to go in with your first book. And I, I would love to know, and I bet listeners would love to know, why did you choose this particular topic? Oh, that's easy to answer. And fundamentally, because my foundational interests are really in healing. And that's why for our seminar today, Shamani, we chose really this topic of healing ourselves and healing science. Your book is all about healing ourselves and focusing on the on the biofield. And for me, fundamentally, healing ourselves has to do with consciousness development and, and getting to know ourselves through the, the development of consciousness. And I also want to heal science, as you were just uh, speaking about. And the idea for the book came from me uh, having conversations with students over the years at UC San Diego and watching students struggle a bit, trying to figure out how do I maintain a spiritual life? Many students over the last couple of decades started getting into meditation and yoga. And, and those practices naturally begin to open things up that weren't quite awake before. And students want those to continue to wake up. But in the academic mindset, particularly a place like UC San Diego, unlike CIHS, there's not that kind of support. And so for some reason, I often had students knock at my door wanting to speak about spiritual things, and we'd just get into it, consciousness development. And I began to see a pattern emerge that we need uh, to have more of a dialogue around consciousness studies and consciousness development, not only in scientists, of course, but, but for everyone. And, and that's really how it started for me. It was an inspiration that I'd like to do something that could have some meaningful effect 
uh, for the individual journey of each human being, which of course is what your book's about too. And you you write about your own exposure to consciousness studies when you were young. In your, in your book, uh, your exposure to Jainism and all these mystical images in your father's book in his library. And that that started a journey for you wondering, wow, how do they know this, number one? Because this has been around for millennia. And then as you started your academic studies, you had the question, well, where's all that wisdom? It's not in my current academic book. So how do I bring that together? And I think that's one of the reasons you started Chi, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. So that's what I'd like to speak about, consciousness and, and its development. Indeed. And, and you mentioned this, you know, in the book, in, in many different ways. What I love about your book, and many things, but obviously the stories are just fun to read. You know, they're really engaging. But I love how you've sort of put them in certain key factors or themes that have come up for many of the spiritual scientists in terms of their motivations to seek answers through the scientific lens but in an expanded way or integrate their spiritual lives more fully to help direct their scientific inquiry you know there are many different stories that you share i have to tell you that one that really um i had not fully heard i think from you before maybe i'd heard bits of it talking with you was around the the story that you mentioned the galactic center (laughs) galactic center story it is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful story. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, you know, I won't I won't spoil it for you. But it was it sounded like it was a profound realization of essentially the goal is not even the proper word, the promise, the promise that perhaps has been given to humanity, you know, even through the lens of our inquiry, whether it's through the scientific sphere as we know it, or through the personal sphere, through our own practice. This story that you shared it is quite meaningful. And, and I'm wondering if you would mind kind of sharing it a little bit more. And I know that we've talked about this. This was a risk for you. I mean, it was a risk for everyone, obviously, to share these stories. And you talk about that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're quite extraordinary, right? They're, and, and many of our scientists are, you know, not necessarily closeted, but they have they are placed in some pretty major universities such as you are and they're kind of coming out of the closet closet you know as as uh, as tiffany likes to say opening the kimono to all of these experiences right that people had not necessarily heard before so the galactic story tell us more about that because i i, I just want to make sure everyone hears this it's so beautiful okay sure i'd be happy to share that and as a backdrop when that experience occurred that was another reason that motivated me to write the book in addition to the idea I shared already about young students coming and me feeling we need to have more of a dialogue on the conversations. We need to find ways to support each other's spiritual development within the context of our life, regardless of what we do as a career, science, any different career. Most careers, it's not easy to integrate the, these kind of discussions. So the, the galactic story really was one of promise of the future of humanity. And uh, some years ago, I did, uh, in the context of a meditation, encounter a vast, what I would call a consciousness mind or a consciousness being. And it was quite a startling experience because I hadn't anticipated it. And basically, this being began to immediately communicate to me about humanity and about the earth. And basically, it told me that it had been watching observing really humanity and its development for eons and eons. It indicated that it's highly interested in humanity, not so much human beings, not individual human beings like you or me per se. There's not that kind of interest, but in the totality of humanity and the totality of human consciousness that we all contribute to. And it showed me that someday in the future, humanity will fulfill the promise for why it was created. And it showed me this as far as an image of the earth. And it showed me that there's going to be a point when we as a humanity have raised our consciousness enough that this will instigate a a, a change in the, let's say, the the atmosphere of the earth, the consciousness of, of the earth or self and humanity. 
and it will bring into form and manifestation a manifestation of something that's never here uh, appeared in the third dimension, our material world, that is. And uh, it's love itself. And it indicated that this is really why humanity, meaning these incredibly mysterious and capable mind-body forms that we have, that's why we were created. And that's why our nurture, our development has been nurtured through the eons and why we're be being given so much attention now that one day we have the capacity to bring love itself into form. And it was a momentous experience for me. And as I began to ponder it, I began to wonder, well, am I personally supporting this movement eventually of humanity? Am I hindering it? Do I need to make changes? And I also began to wonder more broadly, well, what are the sciences doing? Are we supporting this or are we hindering it? And that led me to want to reach out to other scientists and say, how's your spiritual life really? And what are you doing and how's it working? And how's your work contributing to this change many of us have worked on for years, which is to heal this so-called divide between science and spirituality. Something of course, which CIHS as an institution was founded on those principles to heal the rift between religion and science, spirituality and science, really to help bring us back to the full potential of us as human beings and let's transform the world while we're at it in a positive way. So beautiful. Well, that was it, Shamani, really. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so beautiful. So beautiful. What a beautiful, incredible experience and how lovely and honorable for you to share that with us. You know, obviously brave as a, you know, scientist who's come from the reductionist uh, realms, as you say. <laughs> all of yeah. that, but also so meaningful for us and how wonderful that it also brought a question to your mind is how are we bringing love into the sciences? And mm -hmm. even in my, you know, relatively short tenure over the last decades as a scientist, you know, two to three decades, however long it's been at this point, um, I have noticed that shift, you know, the ongoing shift in the sciences, as you know, even our home field of study. Psychoneuroimmunology was initially, of course, really rooted in the pathogenic model in that even though we were uncovering all these beautiful things about the mind-body connection, it was mostly focused on things like depression, anxiety, hostility, disease progression, you know, just that was our filter. And now, of course, we're seeing that change over the decades where there has been increase. And of course, through funding organizations like Templeton, Fetzer, and others who are, you know, providing awards to be able to stimulate research in the virtues like gratitude, which, you know, you led in with Laura Redwine at UCSD, and I was pleased to be involved, you know, mm -hmm. whole programs of research, right, that were exploring things like compassion, things like gratitude, these areas that bring her closer and closer to this perhaps our fundamental human purpose, which is to fully realize love. And so we, we do know that we can evolve our scientific inquiry to those directions. Now, for me, the study of the biofield has, has been very much that. And at this point, you know, from where I'm sitting at the moment, having, you know, the pleasure of conducting my own research and still conducting some of my own research, haven't completely stopped doing that yet. You know, hoping to foster the research of mm -hmm. others, foster community among our scientists, educate people on the current level of evidence. As you know, this is much of what the Consciousness and Healing Initiative does. There's a part of me that also wants to simply stand back and observe without judgment and and there's a wondering that is taking place in me about how this information on the biofield especially as it becomes more and more known you can say more and more known mm -hmm. how it will be used mm -hmm. you know, and, and i think of the work for example of our colleague dr mike levin at tufts university we were really pleased to interview him for our um, science of healing course along with dr lorenzo cohen both of them, as you know, are doing really incredible work in the field right now. We'll, we'll focus on Mike because what Mike is learning is, is so provocative. What he is showing is so provocative. There are many ways that the knowledge could be used. And for mm -hmm. those who aren't familiar with Mike Levin's work, I'll just give a quick synopsis and you can look him up. He's got a great dialogue actually with the TED founder, Chris Anderson, I believe is his name, on his work. 
Mike is, you can say, many would say, cracking the bioelectric code, determining how energy between cell membranes and information carried between cell membranes, if, and he would use the word manipulated, um, if it is manipulated in a certain way, and he is manipulating um, the voltage gradients across cell membranes, could be grow, used to grow new neural tissue. He's um, demonstrated that you know, manipulating these electric gradients across cells can um, stimulate uh, tissue growth, not just in brains, but also the regeneration of limbs. But he's even mm -hmm. using these to create what he calls xenobots, which are essentially planaria that don't die. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's very interesting. Like it's, it's a little mad science, honestly. And, you know, and then of course he's, I think in conjunction with someone else, he's sort of building a company where they can manipulate these bioelectric codes you know, working chemically to manipulate the codes bioelectrically with the hope that we could regenerate limbs in humans and things like that in one way. Mm -hmm. But it, from one lens, it could be re viewed as still quite reductionist, right? There's no mm -hmm. spiritual component to this at all. Um, Mike is definitely an ally of the biofield sciences, no question. And, you know, he's mm -hmm. very focused in this particular area. Now, so we have this work on one hand, and then we have the work of just summarize very quickly Dr. Lorenzo Cohen's work. And, you know, I, I think most of you who know me know I'm a science nerd. So I hope you don't mind that I'm getting into some detail about some of these areas that I consider really cutting edge in biofield sciences that I think are really going to move us forward. And I do describe a lot of this in my book. Lorenzo's recent work with his team at MD Anderson Cancer Center is um, echoing some of the early work that Bill Bankson, Margaret Moga, and others have done, examining the effects of a biofield energy healer on cellular function, particularly mm -hmm. with relevance to cancer. And Paul, as you know, some of these two published studies that are already out from Lorenzo's group recently are showing that, um, and this was with Sean Harabance, but I believe they're using other energy healers at this point also, that emitted bioenergy from a, a healer such as Sean and one study um, demonstrated a reduction in the tumor size, and the second uh, reduction in the tumor spread or metastasis throughout the body. They then looked at the reductions of inflammatory cytokines or those cellular um, mm -hmm. you know, messengers between immune cells, and looked even more downstream at cell subsets, and finally also cell signaling, and found you know, some really tantalizing information about how this energy healing, which was not done by handling the mice, but you know, done by not handling them, both in the same in the same room. However, it's basically getting under the skin, affecting you know, affecting these cells in in very um, strong and clinically important, it would seem, ways, down to cell signaling. And now, as you know, the reason I bring all this up is because, as you know, Lorenzo is going through a lot of stringency to conduct this work. He you know, sure has. People, he's got ex internal and external review boards. He's, you know, did the amount of effort, diplomacy, discussion, communication that he has had to endure <laughs> to simply conduct these studies, right? Because mm -hmm. here he's not looking at a device or manipulating in the typical reductionist way. He's working with an energy healer. It's tremendous what he's had to go through to just conduct these studies. And thank goodness, at least he had the funding to connect it, which is rare, right? That's also rare. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting because when I talk with Lorenzo, he says, well, you know, my, my research is gonna just keep focusing more and more on the mechanism. And, and I have strong views about that, Paul, and I don't know if we wanna get into that discussion, but I, I've said to him, Lorenzo, why so much of the focus on mechanism? You wanna create gene knockouts now of these mice to sort of, supposedly block the effect i mean do you even think that makes sense and mm -hmm. and what i hear is shamani nature science you know all of these top tier journals won't even look at this unless we can demonstrate that we can block the effects either by blocking emfs or doing gene knockout so they're using the same types of models that we would use for drugs to explain something that is not that mm -hmm. so when we consider this journey yeah right this journey of the spiritual scientist and the exploration of our human consciousness and our energy all the way into the third dimension physical matter 
and then we encounter the questions from those who very much live in that third dimensional world who maybe maybe don't ex understand or even you know enter could even entertain this from mm -hmm. the spiritual view I appreciate that for, for all of us who have straddled these domains, there's always that tension. Okay, the, the, the Western model wants me to be reductionistic and get into mechanisms. And I did that for a long time, but then I got kind of got tired of it. So we all have to find that proper balance to advance the work, which I think you've been doing and others uh, on the biofield side. And that's all beautiful. From, from my point of view, you know, science can tell us uh, the how of things which is important, but it can't really give us the why. And from my point of view, the only way we get to the why is by moving into those domains that science has historically not done, which is really the metaphysical and the mystical. And that's where I've been wanting to go lately, just as a natural part of my own life's development and my science, trying to have some conversation going there. And so I wanted to emphasize that, that we all uh, follow our path to advance science and advance our own spirituality and the spirituality of our communities. And um, I think it's the balance. CHS, I think, does a good job of providing those balances, the academic side and the spiritual, as best as, best as it can, too. I mean, that work you were just sharing is intriguing. How do you feel that's advancing the biofield sciences and your, and your efforts to uh, of the CHI organization? Because that's you focus historically on the biofield. I have your book here and I've read it <laughs> and, and uh, for healing and healing ourselves. And, and your, your work is about healing science too, to, to push that boundary of the materialistic boundary past all the things that have been kind of forbidden historically, the so-called forbidden realms of uh, the metaphysical and the mystical. But the more we push that boundary aside and open it up for me, then science will really begin to deliver on its promise which is ultimately to give us insight into who we are as humans, as spiritual beings, and to help us understand ways to develop our spirituality. Again, getting back to the healing, the biofield, that's one of the mechanisms of supporting our consciousness and our consciousness development. I couldn't agree more. And, you, you know, Pablo, as a clinical psychologist, I'm just more of a practical person. So while I find all of this research that is going on on the cellular mechanisms and, you know, or so-called mechanisms, I would say cellular processes, it's all incredibly fascinating. And mm -hmm. as a clinician, my biggest question is not how does it work, but how can it help, right? Mm -hmm. So right. the focus of my work has been more on the clinical applications, what we know about the clinical studies. How could we galvanize that, you know, for massive human healing? How can we open people up to the experience of their own biofields? Was mm -hmm. certainly very helpful to work with healing practitioners. As you know, Paul, many of our friends say, don't call me a healer. There's no such thing as a healer. I am a healing facilitator. I am helping the person to heal themselves by reconnecting themselves with their highest self, their spirit, their soul, God, many different names for it, right? So again, back to the mystical, you know, could it be that uh, the, the mysticism deserves a mechanism is something our friend Mimi Guarneri <laughs> used to say, the mysticism deserves a mechanism, or perhaps the mechanism itself is mysticism. So, Paul, as you know, um, I recently gave a TEDx talk for TEDx Berkeley on this very topic, and yep. it was called We're Wired to Heal Each Other, The Science of Interconnection. So very clear, you know, we kind of agreed on that title. And as you know, TED released the talk with a flag, um, changed the title of the talk without telling me and released it without telling me and didn't tell me there was going to be a flag on it. And the complaint was that or, or the flag was that among many things was, uh, this was based on my personal research, <laughs> which as you know, in the talk, I, I cite Lorenzo's work and many, many other people's work. I had given them, you know, the reference list of 30 peer reviewed published references, many in science and nature and others, and, you know, ton of the biofield work. So mm -hmm. that was very curious. And I've been in dialogue with him about it because I believe the flag is unwarranted. So in the dialogue, it became apparent because I, I would ask them, yeah, I just don't understand why you've put a flag on here. I've been very clear about, and even about what I've said about the field. And I have said, you know, it is an emerging field. It's very clear. We all know that. Yeah. This 
was one of their bones to pick. There was a line that I said when I shared Lorenzo's work and you know all the way down to the cell signaling work. And I said, but in this study, it's not a device or a drug. It's simply a person channeling the currents of compassion to generate a healing response. Well, apparently that was the statement that Ted took issue with. <laughs> That's what I heard. No kidding. You no, know, that is what I'm I heard. Surprised. That I because heard that. they well, this is what they said to me in an email that this was the bone that they had to pick with me because when I said that in the context they said it, they said they said you're suggesting that that's the mechanism. Oh. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I kind of took that in and laughed, and then I thought, well, that's ridiculous. And then I stood back and I said, well, wait a minute. What if love is the mechanism? Mm -hmm. Right? What if love is the mechanism? What if the experiences and everything else that we're looking at is downstream? And, you know, back to the initial part of our conversation and the galactic, you know, information that you received from this being. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of something that Sri Aurobindo and the mother had said. Um, and many perhaps know who Sri Aurobindo and the mother are, spiritual teachers. Um, have an ashram in Pondicherry and, of course, Oroville, kind of the idyllic city, um, the mother's vision. Well, one of the things that I believe it was the mother said is that this this is the time of humanity to bring forth the, the divine in human form. That uh, And she spoke of the consciousness of cells and she spoke of the abilities now during this particular time of our human mm -hmm. and earth cycle that we have this opportunity mm -hmm. to bring the divine all the way into physical form in a way that has never, we've never had that opportunity to before. So when I read about the Galactic Center experience that you had, I thought, wow, this is just, this is really amazing. And so for me, when I tie it back into the biofield work, you know, as you say, this is the promise. This is where I would like to see the work go. It's fun to look at these mechanisms Sometimes I get worried about how it's going to work, because if we're going to continue to work in this sort of more reductionist, third dimensional way, um, disempowering rhetoric and disempowering um, forces that continue to help us believe erroneously based on yeah. the date that healing is outside of us. What is the work? It's a great, you know, it's a great question. I think you're asking the question, getting back to this tension. As long as we continue to adhere to that model for the reasons of acceptance, getting into the top journals, are we limiting ourselves? Are we holding our own progress back, the progress of our research on things such as love, compassion, gratitude? And I think each scientist can only answer that in their own heart and find that inspiration and then make their decisions and move forward. Um, for me personally, I would say years ago, I did stop trying to fit myself in, in certain models to explain, uh, to be accepted, because uh, I think I think there's, there's a big limitation of what most scientists who are in that domain can accept. Just like with Ted, there, there, there's a kind of mental framework that just things can't get through. I mean, Rupert Sheldrake published that book a few years ago, uh, set science free. And he highlights 10 fundamental dogmas, principles within modern materialistic sciences that we do need to crack all of those to get forward, but they're not easy. And from my point of view, the way to set science free is to set scientists free mm -hmm. and let the scientists then have at it in their own way. And if they go away from the materialistic model, so be it. I mean, look at modern medicine. Many people have been moving away from much of modern medicine, moving in more into the integrated medicine side and other ways because it, it just wasn't serving them in the proper way. And that's up to each of us and all of our listeners here today to just make those decisions. Follow your inner guidance and go where you need to go to have your own healing and then heal whatever profession you're in. Make a difference. I so resonate with that, you know, in the, in the third, in the very end of my TEDx talk, you know, just sort of the take home point. So what does all this mean for us? You know, because we get these questions all the time, right? So how do I find a healer? What do I do? Do I take a yoga class? What should I do? And I suggested, well, look at the data, trust your instincts, right? That's, that's, it's, 
very so we forget like we can go into our inner knowing and that for the budding scientists who are you know perhaps engaged in the conversation with us too uh you know my advice is you know definitely trust your instincts that paul i think what you're saying about not neglecting but actually placing our personal development first will guide us to ask the questions that will be the most meaningful for you personally in your research but also for humanity and so because this is what we see when um sometimes and i'm not trying to bash all of academia you know i grew Mm -hmm. up in in the academic circles and i got a lot of value out of it also Uh, but sometimes these systems are are developed in a way that self-development is is becomes limited because they're steeped in a particular culture a way of doing things that is really outdated for personal development. It's very hard to personally develop in some of those systems. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, we hope that that is continuing to change, those systems will be slower to evolve. So working on our own personal evolution will really guide our scientific inquiry. It's, it's such an important driver of our scientific evolution. And I don't think it's been emphasized enough. That's why your book is, you know, among many reasons, just so important. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. And I'll add that for for the listeners that that really um, is resonates with many of the messages of the scientists I interviewed, because they were doing whatever science they were doing, working on their self development where they could. But then they had certain inner realizations, we could say transformations that then gave them like an inner permission, an inner permission then to begin to follow that as a guidance for next steps. As you know, from having read the book, I followed a lot of the uh, general storyline of Joseph Campbell's uh, The Hero or The Heroine's Journey, the so-called monomyth that's common across all cultures. And the monomyth has certain stages. And the first stage is always hearing a call and then heeding the call. And the call is something that typically comes from deep in our soul, our consciousness, and says, you know what? It's time for you to make a change in your life. Mm -hmm. And we're given the option. I can listen and do it, or I can say, you know what? I'm really comfortable here right now. I'm going to stay. And so be it. But but it's important, really, to heed those calls. And then then we're on a journey of self-development. And then new things unfold. And that's what happened for many of the scientists. And many of them then began to change uh, the direction of their research. Or if they didn't change it, if they were still committed to the way it was, they started having much deeper insight into the problems they were studying and the approaches. And the research became, I would say, much more successful. Because when we are more in alignment with our inner life, things like creativity, imagination, inspiration, they turn on more and more and more. That's that's the beauty of um, really being on a spiritual journey and embracing each unknown threshold that presents itself to us. Indeed, beautifully put, yeah. you know, to me, you know, it's it's a biofield effect. <laughs> you're literally yeah. you're literally releasing the, you know, the blockages to your soul's light in order for the soul's light to fully, you know, um, inform you of your mm-hmm. next steps. So it's just a, it's, it brings a great clarity to be able to come into authenticity in that way and sort of own your spiritual life and, and own your expression of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd love over, over, over time, you've done a lot of work already with the consciousness healing initiative in the biofield, but I will love as a, as a scientist and somebody on the journey to see as the future unfolds, Chi uh, begin to help us understand how does the biofield support all this unfoldment. Of course, the biofield includes the different chagras, and we have a sense of how they support things like imagination. But but that's just one little part of the broader biofield and all the information in there. I, I hope to see Chi make so many discoveries that says, bam, mm-hmm. look at this, do this, support this part of your field, and and uh, let, let all these things begin to emerge. Oh, yeah. That- I love that. It sort of feeds into a question that I had for you, which is, you know, given where you are now, right, and having gone through many, many years of traditional training, traditional work, um, deep spiritual experience, 
work in areas that, you know, your spiritual experience has deeply informed. You know, I know that you have done work, for example, exploring non-dual experience and its effects on health, you know, done research on gratitude, biofield work. Mm -hmm. Are there any areas that you hold in your heart, you know, specific areas like the ones you were sort of alluding to just now that uh, you hope to see scientists explore more of in the coming years? Yeah, I'd say most of my interest these days goes back to the topic of our conversation so far is really consciousness and consciousness development. Some of the work I've been doing with the Chopra Foundation and Deepak Chopra explored the wisdom of whole person medical systems such as Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine, Chinese medicine, Native American medicine, so many traditions. And as you know, and in, in Jainism, all these traditions have a deep wisdom about the nature of the human being. Yes, they understand how the body works and the organs are here, but they also understand about the biofield and they understand that we are fundamentally awareness itself operating through these bodies. And so when we were studying these systems, it was an opportunity to bring this dialogue of consciousness, uh, the spiritual nature of the human being back into certainly research and the science side, because we were publishing our papers. But my real goal is to help bring it into medicine mm -hmm. and transform medicine. Medicine, from my point of view, um, it would be uh, improvement if it helped understand the spiritual nature of the human being. We can't always have the health we want, but we can always have well-being. And a medicine oriented towards supporting a person's well-being, that would, that would to me, be a, a big advance, as well as trying to support the health and well a body when we can. But we can't always have that. Despite all of our best efforts, sometimes we get ill. But we can have well-being, which is more just getting to know ourselves and um, kind of the spiritual journey that we're on as a person. So that's been my focus, really. Uh, as of late, uh, we'll see where it develops going forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. And I know one of the things that you're also focused on is helping people integrate, you know, from these experiences, you know, into the everyday realms, you know, helping to, because often, as you know, and, and we see this more and more, of course, with uh, the popularity of uh, entheogens and psychedelics and you know massive uh, spiritual experiences even from 40-day sit meditations where sometimes people are going for those meditations and mm -hmm. they haven't really done a lot of training before so mm -hmm. there's some massive experiences that happen and not necessarily just from those things but just spontaneously these things can happen right um, during meditation they can happen just in everyday practice and then the question arises well We've spoken a lot about, you know, scientists, but of course, for everyone, how do we integrate those experiences in our in our day, daily life? Because often, and you know, we're seeing this in, as a clinician again, as a clinical psychologist, I've become concerned sometimes, seeing um, a lack of integration, right, for the person, and and how that might lead to more mental suffering, mental emotional suffering. So I know that you're you and Tiffany are kind of at work to help provide tools for people to uh, to better integrate. I know if you wanted to talk about any of that work you're doing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and this, this is such an important point. And I do address some of this in the in the final chapter of the book, um, topic of just general consciousness development. And we're all seeking transformation, certainly in this space and community of CIHS. And sometimes we're more prepared than others when we enter into different stages of consciousness. Some people at least have an educational background and they have familiarity with what is typically expected. And if they find themselves in such states, it's like, okay, I know what's going on. Some people, as you were just saying, enter into these states, non-dual consciousness, so, so forth, transpersonal states, they have no idea what's going on. That's difficult. And beyond that too, just having a, a, enough of an ego development is important. Carl Jung speaks about individuation, just as one term, other, other groups have other terms, but we need to have a strong enough sense of ego and identification to be able to then to ultimately allow that to transform. So one of the things Tiffany and I 
teach is called personal self-integration. And it's just to help an individual get to know the whole landscape of their consciousness. Their conscious mind, yes, but also their subconscious mind and the domain and the terrain there. Because it's typically from the subconscious where things can pop up and disorient people and get them ungrounded and get them uh, not in such a favorable state. But by understanding the nature of the unconscious and building conscious bridges, then, then we have the opportunity to really lead a different life. I mean, ultimately, some of the great mystics from India and elsewhere speak about this whole idea of having a conscious mind and an unconscious, eventually that just dissolves into one unified consciousness, because ultimately these kinds of barriers are limitations from our own capability of perception and so forth. And that's a goal. So whatever we can do to aid that by just attending to it and learning about it is, is valuable. That's, that's what we've seen in the work we've done. Amazing. So for those who are interested in deepening that journey, you know, deepening that that journey of uh, fostering an integration, uh, releasing that barrier of the subconscious and the conscious, you know, to bring it to a more unified sense of consciousness. Are there particular practices that you recommend? Do you feel like there is a gold standard practice? Are there many practices? I mean, there, there are certainly many out there. Uh, the ones we use in the courses that we teach are guided meditation. You know, the at which uh, Jung's work and others uh, speak about the term active imagination. Active imagination is a very specific uh, attribute that we as human beings have access to. As you know, in, in Western science and perhaps Western cultures, imagination is often discounted. Oh, that's that's just your imagination. Forget about that. But many people who have really probed deeply into the nature of the human being show that imagination is actually a, it's a spiritual resource. It's part of our soul. Uh, when I've been speaking about the materialistic sciences in the beginning of the book, I quote some of Owen Barfield's work. And he speaks deeply to the importance of imagination for our spiritual development. In one of his books, he, he says basically that when we're perceiving just our day-to-day -day living, if we're perceiving without our imagination online and intact, that creates basically, it's like a sword thrust between matter and the spirit. Without imagination, all we see is matter, which is what the materialistic sciences are all about. They just see like dead matter. When we operate more with our imagination and other spiritual faculties, then we see the spiritual as matter and vice versa. And that, that creates such an opening. So that's part of our work. We advocate cultivation of imagination and use it as a, as a kind of a healing tool and a way to have a journey. It's beautiful. It reminds me of the conversation that Tiff and I were having a couple of weeks ago when we were hiking together about, uh, uh, mm -hmm. was it Rudolf Steiner and the, the development of the astral self at this time beyond the mental self, right? Yeah. Kind of related to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful work. I've always, I'm a big admirer of Steiner and probably that conversation with Tiffy, Tiffany was consistent with some of this galactic center vision. The idea that humanity was brought into form some time ago, but there was a, there was a plan from the beginning and we have certain faculties, some we've already developed. Obviously this physical form's pretty well developed. Our intellect and minds are developed, but there's other faculties that need development, our astral for sure, just more understanding and appreciation and the mastery of our, our, of our deep feeling life and emotions. Mm -hmm. And then there's some things later too. Yeah, we are amazing beings. I just want us to see us all get, get ourselves developed and live the fruitful life that, that all these things within us can offer us. And may Chi help support that, which it is, and CIHS as well. Yes, indeed. All, all of these beautiful um, organizations that stay connected in our service mission, right, to yeah. elevate humanity, help us realize our full healing potential. Uh, we've been very pleased um, with the work, of course, of all of our dear colleagues. And for our part, um, what we notice is uh, 
Well, many things, you know, we continue to help cultivate community across our scientists, but also our healing practitioners. We have a very active, as you know, scientific advisory council and mm -hmm. um, healing practitioner council. And I want to thank you also, Paul, for being on the Consciousness and Healing Initiative board. Uh, you've been just a wonderful mm -hmm. board member in so many ways already and really um, so wonderful for you to help steer the ship of Chi as you are with CIHS as well. Uh, one of the things that we're deeply engaged in right now is making sure that the evidence base that we actually have for the biofield work is mm -hmm. broadly available to practitioners, including healthcare practitioners. So we have a, a dynamite science of healing course that we're offering uh, through the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. We're actually going through it now with a great cohort of about 300 or so people. Most of them are practitioners offering uh, continuing education credits for nurses and mental health prep professionals. And we have a lot of healing practitioners, students as well. We're offering scholarships and everyone's really engaged. It's lovely. So we're really diving into some of these topics that you've mentioned, but in a very stepwise fashion, I would say, exploring consciousness, its relation to the biofield, ancient, modern perspectives, uh, philosophical perspectives, and then really diving into the evidence base behind mind body spirit therapies energy healing practices both the clinical studies the studies with cells and animals you know exploring mechanisms exploring what the evidence actually <laughs> says behind biofield devices yes mechanisms you know all of this and what's beautiful um as i know cihs does this as well including it in talks like this like between you and me uh, what I love about Chi, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, is that it really is this beautiful meeting ground. So we have about 35 guest faculty in the Science of Healing course that mm -hmm. are providing healing practices every week so that we can embody, as you say, it's an embodied learning process. So we begin to learn a new healing practice, say from Donna Eden and Cindy Dale and Pamela Miles and all these wonderful teachers of different traditions of energy healing. So we get that every week. And then these panel discussions of really deep dives uh, into the research and mm -hmm. practice uh, from our leading faculty, many who um, sit in, you know, in major universities and also our stars of the field, like, you know, Deepak Chopra and Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden kind of sharing their perspectives, their broader perspectives on where science is going. As you recall, you were part of that panel with Bruce and with, um, mm -hmm. with uh, Greg, that was really dynamite about how we're moving from models of disconnection to interconnection in science. So, you know, these are some of the ways that we're trying to sort of foster changes within the healthcare community and healing community so that everyone feels very fortified and grounded in the evidence, as well as gets to learn new practices and, you know, kind of connect in the community. So we've been up to that. We're just, we've just finished a feasibility study looking at the effects of distant sound healing for anxiety during the pandemic and are now raising funds for our randomized controlled trial in this area where we're going to really try to target mental health in the communities that are really underserved and um, really need more solutions and more representation in terms of mm -hmm. solutions for mental health. So we're targeting anxiety again, but this time we're gonna try to really recruit from those community clinics that serve um, financially disadvantaged populations, the BIPOC community, that is the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color community, the LGBTQ SIA2 plus communities. I would love to see the biofield work. Sometimes we make this joke about, you know, oh, we got to get the biofield out of the ghetto, so to speak, right? That's a big <laughs> joke. It's like, you know, because in the scientific field, it's still considered for some people not real and all that, which is nonsense, we know. But there's also something about getting the biofield out of the spa, because often what's happening is these practices literally are at the spa, right? But not necessarily in the community clinics where people could really use them. And so many of these practices still, you know, really came from indigenous traditions in the first place. That, that is, they've always been part and parcel of indigenous healing practices. So we are also very interested in not just helping foster healing through transforming healthcare, which we've talked about quite a bit, transforming self-care, which we've also talked mm -hmm. about, but also helping to augment community care. Because I think some of the promise that we can see with our biofield approaches is that you don't have to go to school for five years and get a PhD to practice this. You do need training, right? Um, but there's a promise for some of these approaches, like the sound healing approach that we're using right now that we could train people in the community to use them. 
right? This is highly scalable. We have a massive mental health problem in the world right now, just as an example, as you know. It's very concerning. And with the constant sort of pushing of the disempowering rhetoric by the media and you know other forces, there is a, there's an active need to balance that out with yeah. practices and knowledge that empower the person, including the healer, but also yeah. the client, right? The person coming to the community clinic to seek help. So I'm, I'm very excited for the Consciousness and Healing Initiative to continue to move more in the direction of community care as well as education. And, you know, and then we'll see, you know, in five to 10 years where, where we go after that once we've made some progress in those directions. That all sounds beautiful. And, and the, the research side and the education side, I'm wondering how can she form a stronger collaboration with CIHS? Because she has lots of resources and uh, reach that CIHS doesn't, but CIHS has a lot to offer too with research capabilities, uh, faculty and so forth. We should explore that further with Thomas. Maybe even during the Q&A, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with some ideas. I believe that the, I believe that the way forward is really for us to foster an alliance across all of our organizations, CIHS, mm -hmm. CHI, there's so many wonderful organizations, healing practitioner organizations, energy psychology organizations. We have been discussing this for some time. It is actually in CHI's strategic plan to help foster that alliance. And I completely agree with you. This is all about effective um, you know, etheric and physical networking. <laughs> really, that's that's really what it's about. Sharing our resources, right? Sharing our knowledge base and our wisdom practices, um, yeah. and making sure that we're all coherently aligned in the space. So I'm really looking forward to that, and uh, and I definitely um, see. It. Yeah. Let Let's do that. Let's move into some Q and A. I think Nicole's going to um, moderate for us. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Thank you guys so much. My goodness, I couldn't agree more. Um, and what you guys were just saying, it's all about community and moving from the disconnection to the interconnection. And the more we can connect with one another through all, all of our various networks and organizations, we can continue to spread uh, mm -hmm. this amazing message and uh, promote the future of healthcare. As you said, it's it's not necessarily healthcare. It could be well-being care, right? So, and so many pieces to, you know, digest from your uh, presentation. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you both so much. Um, I love the biofield effect as well, um, letting the soul, the soul's light inform our journey that both of you echoed that. That was really beautiful. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, and as you all know, in attendance today, CIHS is also a pioneer in these mind, body, spirit, integrative education pursuits. Uh, and again, I'd love to um, remind you your donation today makes even more quality events like this possible and allows us to spread these messages, not just to uh, like-minded community, but community in general uh, and inform our friends that we can all make a difference when we tap into that idea of fully realizing love and healing science and consciousness development. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, Again, there have been donations coming in throughout your presentation, so we appreciate that. If you haven't had a chance to donate yet, you can text or click the link in the box. And so there are a couple questions in the chat box. I'm just going to go in order. Uh, the first is from Mary. And also, before we dive in, if you <clears throat> uh, attendees have um, a question that you'd like to ask uh, in person, you can um, you can uh, pop a question in the chat box and I can click the button and allow you to talk and, and speak your question to Shamini and Paul. Okay. So a question from Mary. Hi, Dr. Paul and Shamini. From what um, from what you are talking, I, I am thinking of the Galileo Commission report. What's your opinion on this report? Are you I don't know this report. Shamini, do you know this report? I was just looking it up, actually, and I'm embarrassed to say that also I had not heard of it specifically, but of course, know the scientific and medical network. Um, it appears that they had put this together. I'm also aware of other similar groups, including, I believe, uh, Set Science Free, which I believe has some of colleagues that we know uh, that are a part of that. So again, there is this, you know, beginnings of the coherent, effective movement 
of scientists who understand that we must move beyond materialism if we are going to fully understand um, mm -hmm. human healing capacity, human consciousness capacity, um, and without knowing uh, particularly the Galileo Commission report, uh, I certainly support all of these efforts um, and the people that are behind them. I, th I think it's wonderful. And of course, Paul, you spoke about Rupert's um, book itself, Science Set Free, yeah. right? I wonder that science set free grouping presumably was inspired by Rupert or, or perhaps he's a deep part of it, but yeah, fully, fully on board. And I, I would say our respective books is all about setting science free. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a question from Virginia. Okay. It's a little bit of a longer question. So I have a concern that many scientists that are doing similar research are not moving toward the soul or the divine but tend to move in the direction of technology, manipulation of the quote field or manipulating mm -hmm. genes as opposed to honoring the true wisdom of love and the soul, i.e. Uh, Stuart Hameroff, PhD at the University of Arizona who looks at the role of microtubules in the nervous system. But this is morphing into a transhumanism agenda. Can you mm -hmm. please speak of this concern and how can we as everyday consciously aware beings contribute to more esoteric research. Hmm. Wow, that's great. Uh, let me start on that. One, I'm with you all the way on that. And we spoke a little bit during our conversation about that tension for a lot of scientists between feeling pressure and some, of course, have genuine interest too for pursuing the mechanisms. But then wh where's the boundary between when we're pursuing certain mechanisms that really are moving us into that transhumanism space and not honoring the wisdom of the body. Personally, I, I'm not that in favor of the transhumanism efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's different forces behind it. But as Greg Braden says, we need to develop our spiritual selves fully and completely. And that includes the full development of this human body as, as our tool, as a mechanism, as a beautiful instrument, before we start wanting to modify it with anything. Because he says, as we begin to modify it, who knows how that's going to shut down any of these innate spiritual gifts that we have. And then a person won't be able to get it going. And, and where do we go? I think each of us back to the idea of following our own inspiration, our mm -hmm. own internal guidance, the love we have in our heart uh, to guide where what we should and shouldn't be doing, so to speak. And also where we can put our resources and whose research to support that we feel would make a positive change in the direction of unfolding knowledge and understanding of the spiritual uh, forests. I couldn't agree more. Vote with your dollars, literally. <laughs> like vote with your dollars because there are there's lots of money being funneled into the transhumanism movement, the transhumanism um, agenda. There is an agenda, we are aware of it. And uh, you know, I won't vilify it either, but I share deep concern as many of our colleagues do about the overemphasis of that agenda and the underemphasis of the development of the spiritual being. There are organizations, people that are forwarding the more esoteric aspects of the research. Certainly, um, you know, I could speak for Consciousness and Healing Initiative, our sole focus for the research that we will plan to do on the sound healing approach will be of, you know, the it will be a mixed methods design as our feasibility study is, um, and it's that, that study is currently under review, but the larger study is very much going to be about capturing the personal experiences, including the spiritual experiences of the person receiving the healing, which will be given um, at a distance, actually, virtually, um, with a real emphasis on how does that potential potential spiritual experience drive the changes in anxiety and the relationship with anxiety uh, that this person might have. Because we really uncovered some, well, we didn't have time to really get into that data today, but we've really uncovered some wonderful uh, first steps in that feasibility study, suggesting that these biofield approaches, one of the ways that they you know, work and can be so powerful is that they they shift the relationship of the person with their anxiety. And so we have this actually uh, cataloged in the qualitative data, which will be published hopefully um, this year, where people are literally, you know, describing in the data and we see these resonant themes that um, 
my relationship with myself changed, my relationship with others changed, mm -hmm. and my relationship with my anxiety changed. That is, I can't say that I didn't see or witness anxiety, but I was witnessing it now. I wasn't necessarily in mm -hmm. it because I was more connected to the core aspects of my spirit. So this is data. We can capture this data and we are. So those sort of mixed method studies, those studies that are exploring the spiritual are happening. Um, and we can choose to support those studies, either be by being participants, helping fund them. There are many different ways. And there are many great organizations doing work in that arena. That is great testimony, Shamani, to the value of the more holistic approach that honors the body, mind, the spiritual, and then more healing unfolds, kind of spontaneously, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. The next question uh, piggybacks a little bit on that from Mary. Another question is how to release social anxiety in those whose consciousness are heavily attached by negatively uh, by the negatively unhappy history of the country. Yes, um, th I believe this is why there has been such a focus on trauma, collective trauma. There are many people discussing this, Mary. It's a very astute uh, point. Uh, so I think the first thing is to bring it to awareness. And I think that's where we are right now, you know, as a global humanity sort of bringing about, uh, first of all, owning our experiences in mental health or the lack of it mental, the fact that we call it mental health and not emotional health is still very curious to me. Um, but also its relationship with collective trauma, ancestral history. Mm -hmm. Certainly we're uncovering more of the science of that. You know, we understand that ancestral trauma can be carried through generations. We can look at that on the spiritual level and the physiological level. And I do believe there is a deep place for uh, practice, first and foremost, but also research in helping to release that collective ancestral trauma. And, you know, we don't have time to get into all of that, but there are practices from, you know, indigenous traditions such as restorative circles, uh, which can really help aid us in that release of collective trauma. So it's a great point. Great point. I fully resonate with that and everything you said, Chamani. Yes. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. we have another question from Lali. Um, Chamani's statement, quote, look at the data, trust your instincts. Compared to modern management principle quoted as trust, but verify. Are we making a start by at least bringing trust into a management principle? She's got part two of this question as well. Okay. Um, you want to go for the first part or you want me to go ahead and read well, the second? Uh, Paul, I don't know if you have any comments. I, I didn't know about this management principle, but uh, it makes sense to me. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, I'm, I wasn't aware of it either, but from my point of view, yes. Trust is something that unfolds more and more as we're on along our spiritual path. I would say that everyone's familiar with this term sovereignty, which basically is when a person has had their, their knowledge and wisdom emerging within them, and they use that as guidance for making their decisions. Yes to this, no to that. So I would always advocate developing your own internal guidance above anything else, and then using that as a resonance with what is being presented to you outside in whatever domain it's being presented. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not a sequential process. And so when we talk about trust, but verify, it's also um, trusting ourselves and our inner knowing it's, it's a dance, right? So our inner knowing allows us to come into a trust um, with the person or a situation more readily because we're literally practicing wise discernment, right? Um, yeah, so it's inner verification. verifying data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Inner verification. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we're all so different. And what might be good for me to do might be somebody standing right next to me who has so many identical features on multiple domains, and it might not be the right thing for them. We know. Only we know within our own self. Yep. Great. And then she also suggests two different uh, two options for different people. One, uh, the formal setting of research, focusing on current models of research that can help patients being funded by insurance. Or two, community research to cure 
based on subtler principles where any benefit will be seen as anecdotal and will call for personal payment. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's um, some of the way it's being done now. I think that there are possibilities also to have empirically supported community interventions uh, that hopefully would be fundable um, mm -hmm. and not necessarily require personal payment. I would uh, like to see more of that. I, I think community care is a huge factor for us and one that we should be really um, focusing on in integrative health. Yeah. I fully agree. And you you spoke to that a bit ago, Shamani, about training people to do energy healing that they can dis dis disseminate through their community. Great. A uh, question from Elaine. As a pre-nursing student interested in holistic health, I have been interested in bringing holistic health to the community clinic in my area. What's the best route to go in in order for me to be able to practice holistic health in a clinical setting? Mm. Well, that's a good one. There, as um, you might know, there are quite a number of, uh, they're called Centers for Integrative Health at some of the major academic medical centers and institutions around the United States and Canada. And of course, many individual clinics and in different towns and cities all have more integrative centers where it's 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 much more holistic and some some of these centers have been more successful than others about having a model that's really holistic the intention is there i think from the majority of such centers but some are less successful than others for a variety of reasons so again uh, seek seek out what you think would resonate and uh find what's a good match for you. I agree. First, you know, follow your heart and see what areas of holistic health you're most interested in. And then uh, I think different clinics are different. You know, some may be very welcoming of certain practices. And so it's really about finding that match. I don't think that there are any hard and fast rules. Yeah, for example, some of the integrative, med integrative medical centers I know of specialize more in doing energy healing. And they're not so interested in say acupuncture or OMT and then just the opposite would be found at other centers. So I think eventually there, there's certainly places to find that match. Just takes a little bit of searching. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Another question from Mary um, is how to help release social anxiety in those whose conscious, oh wait, we already did this one, excuse me. <laughs> um, but would you please uh, tell us about the best ways to back up scientific evidence to help early teens to release their social anxiety? Hmm. Shamini, you're the clinical psychologist. <laughs> Well, without taking a, you know, a quick look at the latest literature, we do know that there are empirically supported treatments for social anxiety, and some of these are just the card carrying kind of psychotherapeutic interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy and others. Um, on the biofield side, I don't know if it's looked at, had been looked at specifically for teens um, and social anxiety per se, but we do see a, a tremendous amount of evidence supporting the use of energy psychology practices to help get at the roots of anxiety and help release the roots of anxiety. So that might be a good start. I would uh, start checking out the literature behind that and also um, you know, look for practitioners. There are many different types of energy psychology practices uh, that are out there. One of the ones that has been most studied probably is EFT, uh, but there's also tapas acupressure mm -hmm. technique there um, is AIT or Advanced Integrative Therapy, uh, which was founded by Asha Clinton. Um, she has many, many practitioners that she has trained as well. So there are, there are several options just within the energy psychology uh, realm. And then also the more traditional um, cognitive behavioral therapy can be very, very effective. Great. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Again, if you'd like to raise your hand and speak a question, that is also an option. While people are formulating response to that, I put two links in. The first link, uh, if, if anyone's interested in reading an excerpt from my book, 
then I just put a link in. You can just click on it and it'll, you can download. It's about, I think, 30 pages of, of some of the content of the book. And I also spoke about our uh, personal self-integration course, and I put a link into that if you'd like to learn more about it. That's great, Paul. I'm looking at it, and I think um, I think we'd probably need Nicole maybe to do it because it's gone to just the hosts and panelists. So I don't think the folks um, in the broader. Uh, I'll group... do it right now. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for so pointing much, that out. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Good. All right, we do have one more question. Um, is there is there a theory of the unified biofield of humanity and the planet slash universe? I'm sure there is. <laughs> Maybe you have one. The person who asked the question, I suspect you have some ideas. Paul, what do you think? Well, I'm not aware of specific theories, but just my own personal experience, and I share this experience uh, about the uh, transformation of humanity's consciousness from my point of view from that experience and others i've had indeed there is a universal consciousness of humanity that we each we're kind of reflecting different facets of it but ultimately humanity is um, it's like a massive singular consciousness with beautiful attributes that we're all participating in we're all helping to evolve forward helping each other evolve forward if there are theories out there, yeah, I'd like to read one, but I'm not familiar with them. Hey, I don't know if we would call it a theory, but there's certainly many, many um, ancient wisdom, ancient philosophy based on first person experiences, description of what we might call the unified biofield. And the one that comes to my mind, of course, is uh, is related to what you shared, Paul, and it is, you know, the understanding of, of, Sh of Shiva and Shakti. For example, Shiva being the formless oneness, the unified consciousness, as you describe, and Shakti being the manifest power that brings consciousness into form through what we are calling energy, right? So if that is, you know, if that is a theory, then there's certainly many theories like that out there in the indigenous spiritual traditions across the world. And, uh, you know, one, uh, one, uh, person that uh, the the questioner might want to look up if they haven't looked at his work yet is the work of Irvin Laszlo. Um, you might find um, mm -hmm. some of the some of the books that Irvin has written to be um, very satisfying in this regard. And also Carl Kalaman would be good. Callum, Carl, C-A-R-L, and Kalaman, I think is C-A-L-L-I-M-A-N. He's spoken about uh, consciousness evolution throughout the universe. Mm. Great. Okay. Great. Well, if there's no further questions, then I would just like to give a very big thank you to Paul and Shamani for your presentation today, for joining us at CIHS and celebrating our 30 year anniversary. We uh, wholeheartedly appreciate you being here and the discussion that we had today. So thank you very much. And then also to everybody to, who's here, if you're new to our community at CIHS, welcome. We are so happy that you are here. Uh, we hope that we will continue to see you at events like these and continue collaborations with T and uh, more follow more work from Paul and Shamani. Um, mm -hmm. So very very appreciated you guys being here thank you thank you so much nicole appreciate it as well and i invite anyone who wants to learn more about our nonprofit, the consciousness and healing initiative or chi you can simply go to chi.is or chi.is and uh, it will take you to free webinars and lots of resources and fun things um do feel free to connect in uh, with us as a as a connected community and uh, Thomas very much look forward to our discussions on how we can further collaborate. Wonderful. I'm very excited about that. And thank you so much, Shamani and Paul today. You're welcome, Thomas. And I want to congratulate uh, CIHS on reaching this milestone of 30 years. And I encourage all of our listeners to to make a donation because this topic of science, spirituality, human evolution, CIHS is one of the earliest pioneering institutions to really address this and continues to do good work today. So let's all uh, support the institution.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, a recording will be available in about a week or so. So um, we look forward to sending it out to our community at large. So thank you all again. Thank Great. you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.